This is Tabula Rasa. Now, I have noticed in my recent videos that things like LGBT stuff, feminism stuff, or artsy comic book stuff gets less traffic than my mainstream comic book reviews and responses to controversy. But in this case, I do think it is important to not simply take an influencer's words for stuff that they say and occasionally dive into primary sources. So we are going to look at the essay, Laura Mulvey's Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. If you do like this sort of content, like, share, subscribe, do the YouTube thing, and help the channel. And here we go. Now, you can't go through YouTube and cinema and popular culture today without hearing the words male gaze, feminism, and all the baggage that comes with. So where does this all come from? Well, part of it does come from Laura Mulvey, who was born in August 1941. She is a film theory professor, specifically a feminist film theory professor. She was an avant-garde filmmaker and a neo-Freudian. I do have a problem with the last part, but regardless. One of her biggest contributions to society, besides the films she has made and the classes she teaches, is the essay Visual Pleasures and Narrative Cinema, in which we see that it can be cited by many YouTubers, feminists, pop cultures, and everyone who opposes that kind of stuff, or whatever. And it brings a source of credibility to their views. After all, they wouldn't be talking about her or citing her work if she wasn't credible, right? But the question is, at least for me, is one, what is the essay? And two, have they actually read it? And for the most part, I don't think they have, or, or at least not in any way that demonstrates they have, specifically citations in the context of which it was written in an essay. A lot of people can quote mine, but as we can see, quote mining can be very misleading. So what I am going to try to do here is we're going to read through this essay. Now it is a dense little essay of less than 12 pages. Uh, so, but that being said, it is important to actually read through it. So let's start with... The Introduction, Part 1, A, Political Use of Psychoanalysis. This paper intends to use psychoanalysis to discover where and how the fascination of film is reinforced by pre-existing patterns of fascination already at work within the individual subject and the social, social formations that have molded him. It, start, it takes as a starting point, as starting point the way film reflects, reveals, and even plays on the straight socially established interpretation of sexual differences which controls images, erotic ways of looking, and spectacle. It is helpful to understand what the cinema has been, how its magic has worked in the past, while attempting a theory and a practice which will challenge this cinema of the past. Psychoanalytic theory is thus appropriate here as a political weapon demonstrating the way the unconscious uh, patriarchal society has structured film form. <sighs> okay, I immediately disagree with using science politically, especially an outdated view of psychology. But, you know, again, let's just move on. Okay, so psychoanalytic theory is thus appropriate here as a political weapon demonstrating the way the unconscious patriarchal society has structured film form. Ugh. I mean, just first paragraph alone just makes me go, Ugh. okay, so here's the thing. Film is a reflection of the directors and writers, producers and whatnot, right? Thus, one film or a series of film can never be used as a representative representative of society as a whole, because it's always going to be incomplete. Uh, if you know how statistics works, you'll understand why this is a fallacy. If you don't, then while well, pointing it out, won't really matter much for you. But basically, it is an issue of how well your sample represents your population. If you are biased in picking your sample, naturally your results are going to be biased as well, right? 
So, again, kind of putting the cart be not even again, you know, this is putting the cart before the horse, right? Okay, psychoanalysis uh, is a theory in psychology and a set of therapies which aims to treat mental disorders by investigating the interactions of the conscious and the unconscious elements. Its origins and theories started with Sigmund Freud, and Freud, who was one of the first people to look into the unconscious, and many of his theories explaining it are only supported by a minority of people who practice psychology today, although his methods, such as couch talk and um, first case analysis, that sort of thing, uh, are still used, but probably not in the way that Freud has done it. And uh, and since psychoanalysis was used for individuals to help people with their mental health, using it for a using it as a critique for society is simply just using it out of context. Now you might think, oh, society can be viewed as one thing, so you can use it. But again, there's so many things just wrong with that. It isn't a political tool, and as flawed as it was during Freud's time, it did help people of the mental health profession to lead to a better understanding of mental health. And Mulvey, who is not educated in the social sciences, much less you know psychology or anything like that, shouldn't be using it as a political weapon. Now, since I don't think she really understands it to begin with, much less understands that Freud's views were simply just his opinions and not been shown with any sort of empirical evidence that supports his schema on how the unconscious works. Uh, this just means that psychoanalysis isn't appropriate here, especially not for political motives. So yeah, a lot to unpack in that just first paragraph, but let's, let's move on. Um, the paradox of phallocentrism in all of its manifestations is that it depends on the image of the castrated woman to give order and meaning to its world. An idea of woman stands as linchpin to the system. It is her lack that produces the phallus as a symbolic presence. It is her desire to make good the lack that the phallus signif signifies recent writings in screen about psychoanalysis and the cinema has not sufficiently brought out the importance of representation of the female form in a symbolic order in which in the last resort it speaks castration and nothing else. To summarize briefly, the function of a woman informing the patriarchal unconscious is twofold. She first symbolizes the castration threat by her real absence of a penis and second thereby raises her child into the symbolic. Once this has been achieved, her meaning in the process is at an end. It does not last into the world of law and language except as a memory which oscillates between memory of maternal plentitude and memory of lack. Both are posited on nature or on anatomy in Freud's famous phrase, the woman's desires is subjected to her image as bearer of the bleeding wound, she can exist only in relation to castration and cannot transcend it. She turns her child into the significant of her own desire to possess a penis, the condition she imagines of entry into the symbolic. Either she must gracefully give way to the word, the name of the father and the law, or else struggle to keep her child down with her in the half light of the imaginary she, woman then stands in patriarchal culture as the signifier for the other for the male other bound by symbolic order in which man can live out his fantasies and obsessions through linguistic commands by imposing them on the silent image of woman still tied to her place as bearer of meaning not maker of meaning oh uh, so phallocentrism and the castrated woman. Oh, 
what well, I mean, what can I say? A castrated woman is required to phallocentrism, and it is her desire to make good luck. I mean, I, I don't know how to interpret this second paragraph. I, I really don't. And uh, the thing about the article on screen didn't show enough that the women, from a symbolic point of view, represents castration and nothing else. I mean, I'm just... Am I, am I reading this correctly? I, I, I don't know. And the twofold part, one, the woman is a threat of castration because she has no penis. And two, the child she raises into the symbolic. Symbolic what? I, I don't... I mean... Define your terms, woman, please. Uh, and then something about the woman's desire being subjected to her image as a bearer of the bleeding womb, which is assumed, so you can't really take that at face value. And what does she, what the hell does she mean by the half light of the imaginary? Okay, um, so this second paragraph, I think it's a lot of word salad in that, um, it's a long and pretentious way of saying men boss women around. At least that's how I understand it. I mean, it, it's confusing to say at the very least. Uh, paragraph three. Let's see what that says. Uh, there is an obvious interest in this analysis for feminists. A beauty in its exact rendering of the frustrations experienced under the phallocentric order it gets us nearer to the roots of our oppression it brings an articulation of the problem closer it faces us with the ultimate challenge how to fight the unconscious structured like a language uh, par uh, parentheses formed critically at the moment of arrival of language and parentheses while caught within the language of the patriarchy there is no way in which we can produce an alternative out of the blue but we can begin to make a break by examining patriarchy with the tools it provides of which psychoanalysis not only but an important one we are still separated by a great gap from important issues for the female unconscious which are scarcely relevant to phallocentric theory the sexing of the female infant and a relationship to the symbolic the sexually mature woman as non-mother maternity outside of the signification of the phallus the vagina ellipses but at this point psychoanalytic analytic theory as it now stands, can at least advance our understanding of the status quo of the patriarchal order in which we are caught. Um, so from that, I get women are frustrated in this phallocentric order, which I'm assuming is kind of like another way of saying patriarchy or male-based society. Uh, the challenge of fighting languages. Um, Hey, uh, are you ignoring, lady, that the languages change over time? Hell, you know, the way people talk now, or the kids talk now, and the adults talk now, I mean, it changes. Language changes, so are you not counting that? I mean, uh, I don't know. And then uh, use of psychoanalytic theory outside of its context and scope to understand the status quo. Uh, is that another way of saying just observe society? I don't know. Or maybe she's actually thinking that society needs a psychoanalyst or someone in that. But then again, psychoanalysis isn't meant. It's not even. I mean, it barely works for. I mean, it, did, it barely worked as therapy in her time, much less, you know, it's used more effectively today. But. That being said, you don't use it on society as a whole. So why are we taking her views seriously on this? She's using something, psychoanalysis, that was never meant to be used to analyze society. It's meant to analyze or break down someone's mental health in a way to understand and process it, essentially. And that's not it here. Okay, let's look at part B. The destruction of pleasure is a radical weapon. 
as an advanced representation, the cinema poses questions of the ways of the uncon of the ways the unconscious formed by the dominant order. This is formed by the dominant order is in parentheses. Unconscious structure, way of seeing, and pleasure in looking. Cinema has changed over the last few decades. It is no longer the monolithic system based on large capital investments, exemplified by at its best by Hollywood in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. Technological advances, 16 millimeter, etc., have changed the economic conditions of the cinematic production, which can now be artisanal as well as capitalist. Thus, it has been possible for an alternative cinema to develop, however self-conscious and ironic Hollywood managed to be. It always restricted itself to formal mise-en-scene, reflecting the dominant ideological concept of the cinema. The alternative cinema provides a space for a cinema to be born, with, which is radical in both a political and aesthetic scene and challenges the basic assumptions of the mainstream film. This is not to reject the latter moralistically, but to highlight the ways in which its formal preoccupations reflect the physical obsessions of society which produced it. And further, to stress the alternative cinema must start specifically by reacting against, those, uh, against these obsessions and assumptions. A politically and aesthetically avant-garde cinema is now possible. It can only, but it can only still exist as counterpoint. A uh, reaction to this, though, not necessarily monolithic. Hollywood is still based on large capital investments. You know, one can say that it's even more like that now than it was in the 1930s, 40s, or 50s. And even though the means of entry has been Greatly diversified in the digital age that we see today, YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, and whatnot. Uh, but this main form of mass visual entertainment has become mainstream, not because of any sort of political or aesthetic sense at all. You know, in short, uh, the future from w which we can see the past from here, the present shows that the past. Oh, basically shows that political and aesthetically avant-garde will only exist as a counterpoint and a very niche one at that. Let me just look at what's popular now and see if it's trying to make any sort of message or anything, or at least the most popular versions. And for the most part, you can say not really. It's a reflection of what society is today, not trying to make a point about society, right? Usually those ones don't do too well. Okay, let's move on to the second paragraph of part B. Uh, the magic of Hollywood style at its best and all of cinema, which fell within its sphere, sphere of influence, arose not exclusively but in one important aspect from its skilled and satisfying manipulation of visual pleasure. Yeah. Okay. Unchallenged, mainstream films coded the erotic into the language of the dominant patriarchal order. In the highly developed Hollywood cinema, it was only through these codes that the alienated subject, torn in his imaginary memory by a sense of loss, by the terror of potential lack in fantasy, came near to finding a glimpse of satisfaction through its formal beauty and its play on its own his own formative obsessions. This article will discuss the interweaving of that erotic pleasure in films, its meaning, and in particular, the central place of the image of woman. It is said that analyzing pleasure or beauty destroys it. Wow, you think Anita Sarkeesian got that message? Uh, that is the intention of this article, the satisfaction and reinforcement of the ego that represents the high point of film history hitherto must be attacked not in favor of a reconstruction new pleasure which cannot exist in the abstract nor intellectually un nor of the intellectualized unpleasure but to make way for a total negation of the ease and plentitude of the narrative fiction film the alternative is the thrill that comes with 
that comes from leaving the past behind without rejecting it, transcending outworn and oppressive forms, or daring to break with normal pleasurable expectations in order to conceive a new language of desire. Um, the coding of erotic language into the dominant patriarchal order. I don't know about her, but I mean, the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, isn't that when the Hayes Codes were around? And then after that, it was the McCarthy trials and, you know, the strict self-censorship. I mean, you know, if anything, fighting for the portrayal of sex and not just the bedroom kind and eroticism in films, especially in the mainstream, has, you know, especially for films made for adults. And I'm not talking about adult you know, porn, pornographic films, but films made for, you know, grown-ups, essentially, has always been a challenge. You know, they always have to keep, you know, pushing the envelope, you know, and as part of portraying the mature themes and ideas, you know, that's never been Hollywood shtick. As much as they like to say that they're progressive and whatnot, the history of Hollywood shows that they've been anything but. They have been you know enforcing the status quo more or less if it's a little bit too edgy if it's a little bit too you know risque you know if there was a choice between playing it safe or what hollywood perceives to be safe and doing something new they're always hollywood is always going to go with playing it safe and then on top of that even if it's something risque right Unless it's going to make them a lot of money, they're not going to do it. And it's only when it's been established that something risque will make them money is the only time they'll do it. So, again, you know, I don't think, you know, it's like, what kind of Hollywood are we looking at here? Are we, or does she know something more than I don't? I really don't think so. Okay, um, so this article focuses on the erotic pleasure in films, meaning, and its main focus will be the central place of the image of woman i really don't like the language that she uses it's kind of like a in crowd out crowd kind of thing so if you're in the know then hey you know oh yeah she's making a lot of sense but for someone like me it's like what are you talking about i what like seriously like this what is the symbolic what is the order what is the imagery i mean just you know if, if it sounds pretentious to be honest and, you know, the the ego, id, ego, super ego, no one really uses that today, much less, you know, I don't know if it was even that popular during her time, even. And even if you want to say, yeah, it was, today we show that there's no real evidence for id, ego, or super ego. If anything, it's useful as a concept, an idea, right? But as far as any sort of practical use out of it, no, it's not. Right? Uh, I mean, I don't get it. So, here's the thing. The view that I have of... That I have so far, and this is, mind you, the first two pages, really. Uh, the view that I have of Mulvey is that she's similar to that of someone like Ben Shapiro, or Milo Yiannopoulos, or Jimmy Dore, or Anita Sarkeesian. I mean, that last one was probably obvious. You know... In that um, she's just a social commentator and not even an expert on that. She's just someone who knows stuff and sounds smart. Uh, you know, take away Ben Shapiro out of the list maybe or not because, you know, he did go to law school. So he is an expert of the law. But, you know, Mulvey is not an expert on psychology. She's not an expert on sociology she is at best a filmmaker so if she wants to talk about symbolism within the films and that kind of stuff that's great but using the language of science in this case psychology or psychoanalysis i don't think she should be using it at all unless you know she's you know actually indicated that she's learned about it but in this case i don't see anything outside of what one might see in pop psychology. Now, that being said, I'm not a film theorist. My bachelor's was in psychology. 
And so I do tend to think more like a social scientist that focuses on evidence that can be backed by experiments or data. At least that's how my university taught their psychology courses with several uh, courses revolving around methodology and statistics, right? And in that, I can see that Mulvey may not have read through Freud entirely, and if she did, she didn't read. She certainly didn't read the works of his critics, or kept up to date with the literature at that time regarding the unconscious in psychology. So, from what I can see, there really is no credibility or validity regarding her views within psychology, right? Much less applying it to society as a whole, or even within cinema. She is an avant-garde filmmaker, right? And she has a political in agenda, and she's just basically using this branch of psychology to justify her views. A branch of psychology, in which I am repeating myself, has long since moved past the psychoanalytic theory of Freud, even during her time, even more now. And her views in itself are more similar to a literary analysis applied to films, in that you can simply pick and choose whatever examples which is not evidence that you need and you know you don't even need evidence for literary analysis you just need an example right and that supports your views so if you see a certain type of coding within cinema you will certainly find them but are you going to be atten paying attention to when you're not finding them the the essay's foundation, in this case, is centered on a confirmation bias, availability heuristics, and misinformation. So, hey, if I think in order to find a more efficient and productive means of ensuring equality, which is, I guess, the goal, right? We simply have to put this essay to the test and not simply just view it as a persuasive article and just leave it as how persuasive or not persuasive do you find it, right? But actually try to find the hard numbers behind the claims that the authors has made and will make in continuing to read this. So basically, we need to find a better version of the Bechdel-Wallace test or otherwise known as the Bechdel test. Now, the bechdel Wallace test may tell you if a woman will talk about something other than a man in a film. It doesn't tell you whether or not that representation in the film is well done, right? But we need more tests like this if we want to take people like Mulvey seriously, right? I mean, they just need more than fancy, pretentious words to back up their claims. And I may be... A affecting my objectivity here, right? But I don't think you'll find anything like that within this essay. This essay is strictly politically driven, right? She has an agenda. She wants to push it forward. She has an agenda in film. She wants to push that forward. She has her own views. These are essentially opinions, which is fine. But why should anyone take these opinions seriously? Even from face value, right? You may agree with her that uh, women are portrayed sexually in films, right? That is true. To say that um, it is a result of patriarchy, or maybe it's just simpler than that. You know, Freud did say, you know, Freud did have a problem with cigars, and his response to that is sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, right? Sometimes it can be as simple as, hey, the people who made that film liked that image. And that's it. No deeper meaning, no deeper agenda, no unconscious whatever thing, right? It's just simply, hey, I like this, and I put it in the film, right? It could be as simple as that. But this ignores any of that, really. So, you know, I hope that people won't view this more of an attack as Mulvey, but knowing that this is the internet, they probably will. But just want people to know that this isn't something that you have to take with face value, especially if this is your only source of citation for your views, right? It, you need more. This is not enough. 
All right, and that is how I'm going to end it. We will continue this on on another day. In the meantime, I hope you are enjoying your day or evening, however, whenever you're watching this. And ciao. If you did make it this far into my longer video, almost a half an hour at this point, you must have liked the content or at least, you know, enjoyed what I was saying. Something, whatever. Either way. Like, share, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. It does help the channel. And thank you for listening.